First question. How many people here consider themselves high energy physicists? This is not a test. <laughs> How many astrophysicists? OK. Um, my lectures are basically very elementary. I'm not going to uh, do very, very fancy things. I see people in the audience that I know. Many of them are my students. Some of them know more than I do. This is not for you guys. Oh, but you can help me. You'll be able to help me. Um, we're going to be talking about eternal inflation. Eternal inflation is a very subtle and slippery subject. And in fact, it's one that I think is yet to become a subject. It's, it doesn't really exist yet in the proper form of a theoretical uh, construction. And so I don't find it uh, conducive to the kind of formal presentation that if we were doing some aspect of quantum field theory, instantons or spontaneous symmetry breaking or things like that, which in the past I have given summer schools about, where you start from a definite set of principles and you work your way through and in the end you have some kind of beautiful structure, uh, we're going to start with what looks like it might be a beautiful sub subject and watch it get uglier and uglier and uglier and so for that reason, there's no real point in starting with a uh, very, very systematic starting point, because there is none. Um, never, let me nevertheless tell you what the givens are for me. You may have different givens. Other people who will lecture at this school will very definitely have different givens, givens, you know, our assumptions. The first is that Einstein gravity is correct at least at relatively low energies. There will be corrections, and in fact, those corrections might be monstrously big things near black holes or near horizons. But at least uh, in uh, the beginning, we're going to begin assuming that Einstein gravity is correct at low energies. We're not going to be doing modified gravity. We're not going to be doing uh, uh, Einstein. We are going to be doing Einstein. Next. We're going to assume there's a collection of scalar fields. I'm sorry, I, I, I don't feel like writing this on the blackboard. If you want to take notes, be my guest. But uh, I'll just tell you anyway. Uh, we're going to assume there's a collection of scalar fields. How many scalar fields? Well, that's uh, somewhat in the eye of the beholder. Nobody knows how many scalar degrees of freedom there are. Some people think there are hundreds of them. Other people think uh, that the Higgs boson is all there is. But there is at least one, and probably more than one, because inflationary theory, which is a successful theory, requires another one. So there's at least two, and probably more. Whether it's 500 or whether it's two is not going to make a lot of difference for us in these course of lectures. But there do exist scalar fields. That's basically a postulate. And those scalar fields have a potential, V of phi, Soon I'll start writing on the blackboard, but uh, everybody knows V of phi. Anybody not know V of phi? Everybody is a friend of V of phi. All right. Now, the configuration space of these scalar fields, together with the potential, define something called a landscape. The landscape is simply the space of all possible values of the scalar fields. And you can think of points on the landscape as environments. At every point in the landscape, the scalar fields influence how other degrees of freedom interact with each other. They provide masses for particles. They may provide coupling constants and so forth. So those scalar fields can also be just thought of as environments or specifying the environments. The minima of the scalar field or scalar fields, the minimum of the potential, are stable, or at least classically stable, environments. They're the points where the environment can settle down and stay there stably, but in quantum mechanics in general, they will at best be metastable. In other words, possibly one can tunnel out of these minima from one environment to another. Next, as I said, we're assuming, now I need to get up and write, uh, We have a potential, many, many minima, or two minima. It won't matter for us, at least in the beginning. 
We're not going to be studying incidentally questions about anthropic principle and things of that nature. We're studying, we're going to try to study the mathematics of eternal inflation and the phenomena of eternal inflation, if it makes sense, doesn't really depend on how many minima there are as long as there are a few minima. Some of those minima will have positive energy, some of those minima will have negative energy, and some of those minima will have exactly zero energy. All right. The solution of Einstein's equations at any one of these minima is the sitter space. The sitter space is a space of uniform curvature a space of uniform positive curvature and it's characterized by a radius of curvature. It's characterized by a radius of curvature or if you like a curvature which is 1 over the square of the radius of curvature and the connection is that the radius of curvature R which I'll call R, the radius of curvature R, which I'll also sometimes call 1 over H. R is the radius of curvature. H is the inverse radius of curvature. It also happens to be the Hubble expansion coefficient or the Hubble expansion parameter for the expanding de Sitter space. That's why it's called H. And it's given by 8 pi Newton's constant divided by 3 times the value of the potential energy at the minimum. Can everybody see this? Yeah, okay. Sorry, I got this wrong. Wait, yes, it's squared. This should read h squared is equal to that. h squared is equal to that. So, and that's 1 over r squared. So r is large when v is small. V is large, R is large when V is small. A very big universe corresponds to a small vacuum energy. All right, our first goal is going to be to understand the sitter space. How many people here are expert at the sitter space? I know a few of you are very expert at it. All right, good. That means we can start with the sitter space and I won't feel guilty about wasting your time. If I am wasting your time, get up and leave. Okay, the sitter space, as I said, is a space of constant positive curvature, but it's a space of constant positive curvature with Minkowski signature. With, with Euclidean signature, a space of constant curvature would, of course, just be a sphere. The world is four-dimensional, and we will take the case of four-dimensional de Sitter space. But uh, let's begin with the case of a four-dimensional sphere. I'm just going to draw on the blackboard a sphere. Here's a sphere, and let's think of it as embedded in coordinates, one of which I'll call t, and the others I'll call x sub i, x1 through x3, uh, x1 through x4. This is a five-dimensional space, and embedded in the five-dimensional space is a four-dimensional sphere, and it's given by t squared plus xi xi. This, uh, by definition, means the sums of the squares of the x's, t squared plus xi xi equals r squared equals 1 over h squared. Now, that's not the sitter space, of course. It's just a plain sphere. And we can coordinatize the sphere or chop up the sphere into layers. These layers are going to correspond to space-like surfaces uh, in several different ways. The first way we might, t, of course, is going to stand ultimately for time. We can chop them up into space-like sections and think of time, Euclidean time in this case, is unfolding from the bottom to the top. But of course, in this case here, t and x are completely symmetric, so there's no sense in which t is uh, time any more than x is time. But to go to the sitter space, we put a minus sign in here. Now we have a Minkowski space metric, and the Minkowski space metric describes a, well, the space looks like a hyperboloid now. So let's draw a hyperboloid in here. Now that is the sitter space, but we can again divide it, not divide it, but foliate it, I guess is the mathematical word, 
foliated by a sequence of space-like surfaces that provide a notion of space and a notion of time. Okay? Let's write down a metric. If we were writing the sphere, let's write the sphere first. Here's the sphere. ds squared is equal. There's an r squared on the outside. And then what multiplies that can be thought of as the metric of a unit sphere. And that can be written d tau squared. I'll tell you what tau is in a moment. Plus cosine squared tau times d omega 3 squared. d omega 3 squared stands for a unit sphere. What is tau? Tau is angle measured from the equator over here. Tau is angle measured from the equator. d tau squared is just that term. Cosine squared tau times the metric of a unit sphere of one less dimension. In this picture here, the unit sphere of one less dimension or the sphere of one less dimension would be a circle. All right, so this is the metric of a sphere. When you go from the sphere to the hyperboloid, all you do is change the sign of time-like variables, and this will become ds squared is equal to r squared times minus d tau squared. But the cosine squared tau becomes not cosine squared. Cosine, of course, or tau, if it were an angle, runs over a finite range. On the hyperboloid, the corresponding quantity runs over an infinite range, and it becomes hyperbolic cosine. the omega-3 squared. The hyperbolic cosine of, or not the hyperbolic cosine, but tau itself, instead of being an ordinary angle, becomes a hyperbolic angle along the hyperboloid. A hyperbolic angle whose trigonometric functions are hyperbolic sines and cosines and so forth. This is the metric of the Sitter space. It's the metric of the Sitter space in what is called global slicing, where you slice, where the space-like surfaces are slices which slice right through the whole thing. It has the form of a Friedman-Robertson-Walker metric. Uh, we'll make a little bit of a change of variables. Let's make a little bit of a change of variable. Let's call r times tau, let's call it t. So this will become minus dt squared plus hyperbolic cosine squared of h times t divided by h, h squared. 1 over h squared is the same as r squared upstairs. So r squared becomes 1 over h squared. And tau is equal, sorry, do I have this right? Yeah, I do. Tau is equal to h times t times d omega 3 squared. This has the form of a Friedman Robertson Walker metric with a time, conventional proper time, and a scale factor. The scale factor, let's write it down, the scale factor a of, tau, a of t is equal to 1 over h hyperbolic cosh of ht. Now, thought of as a Friedman Robertson Walker metric, it has some unusual properties. The scale factor increases exponentially at late time, but it also has a contracting phase, has a contracting phase and a bounce and an expanding phase, and that's one presentation of the Sitter space. It's one way of writing the metric of the Sitter space. Let's consider some more ways of writing the, uh, the Sitter space. Let's see, I guess we can put this up. This, this large number of blackboards here makes me very uncomfortable. Matthias, is, um, this whole room makes me uncomfortable. The paneled walls, uh, at Stanford we would never have a room like this. <laughs> <laughs> but there is something good about the Institute for Advanced Study, for particularly somebody of my age. It's a wonderful place to come to lose weight. OK, no more insults. 
Yeah. OK. Notice that uh, the space-like surfaces have been defined by introducing planes and slicing the space by a sequence, foliating it with a sequence of planes. Incidentally, because this geometry here has Lorentz invariance, a five-dimensional Lorentz invariance in this case, T and X uh, define five-dimensional variables, you can Lorentz transform your initial surface here and tilt it. Tilt it by ordinary Lorentz transformation, and it won't change the metric. So there are many presentations of the same De Sitter space, all of which are global slicing, which are sort of related by tilting the surface that slices right through it. OK, so that's, uh, that's global slicing of the sitter space. What other kinds of presentations are there? Basically, there's one for every possible, not every possible way, but for a large number of ways of choosing planes to slice it up with, to foliate it with. The next way uh, is instead of choosing space-like planes, in fact, what we're actually doing is taking the limit in which the boost here, the boost or the change of the angle of these slices, goes all the ways up to light-like. So this would be slicing the De Sitter space with light-like planes. It would look something like this. That would be a light-like plane. That would be one which is asymptotic and uh, uh, divides the hyperboloid right in half. The light-like slicing only takes into account half of the space. And here's what you do. You take light-like planes like this. You take one generator, I guess it's not called a generator, but one hyperboloid along the hyperbola here, uh, one hyperbola along the hyperboloid, and you mark off equal proper time. In other words, what was called equal t or equal tau over here, you mark off equal time, and then you draw a light-like surface through each one of these. Now, the light-like surface intersects the hyperboloid on a space-like surface. How do you see that? Think of the intersection of the light-like surface with the hyperboloid. The light-like surface intersects the hyperboloid with some motion, so to speak, in the plane perpendicular, to, in the line perpendicular to the blackboard. So if we were, well, let's just draw it. Here's the hyperboloid, and one of these planes intersects something like that. I'm not a very good drawer, but uh, that's, uh, you, you, I think you can get the idea. And you notice right over here, that the intersection is sticking right out of the blackboard and it's purely space-like. Anywhere along here, this intersection is space-like. So these are a space-like foliation, again, of the same hyperboloid. And you can work out what the metric is in terms of a time variable which proceeds from minus infinity over here up to plus infinity over here. All right, so let me, tell, let me give you the metric, but this is your first problem. Prove that in this light-like slicing of the sitter space, the metric is given as follows. Oh, each one of these surfaces is characterized by the time at which it intersects one of the, uh, one of the hyperbolas here. All right, so here's the metric. The metric is, again, ds squared is equal to r squared. And now it's really simple. Minus d tau squared, same tau, hyperbolic angle along here, plus e to the 2t, e to the 2 tau, dxi dxi. Now, this dxi dxi, this is three-dimensional space, not four-dimensional space. The whole space is four-dimensional. This is flat space. Flat space space, not space time. Flat space. And this is sometimes called the flat slicing of the sitter space. It's the same geometry. It only covers half of the full geometry that was, uh, that was characterized by the full hyperboloid here. And it covers the half from an asymptotic plane right through the middle here out to infinity. This is for you to prove that this is the same geometry except sliced up in this other way here. We can also rewrite it as minus dt squared 
plus 1 over h squared e to the 2 h t dx squared. The x squared, again, being flat space. All right, so this is the flat slicing. And in this slicing, it just looks like a FRW universe. Uh, let's see, let's come over here. This was a closed FRW universe in cosmological language. It corresponds, corresponds to k equals plus 1. This is the same geometry, but written so that it looks like a k equals 0. In other words, a flat FRW geometry with a scale factor which is e to the h tau, ht divided by h. So in this geometry, it's a k equals 0 FRW with a scale factor which again increases exponentially. Now these different presentations are actually closely related to each other. In particular, if you let t get very late over here, then the cosh increases like a simple exponential. And so one way of thinking about this presentation over here is it just corresponds to the late time limit of this one. But it also stands on its own right as a different slicing, covering half the geometry. All right, so remember now, your job is problem number one. Prove that that's the same metric as that one over there. Next slicing. Let's come over to here. Next slicing. I bet my students think they know what the next slicing is, and they probably do. The next slicing, begin again with the sphere. Here's the sphere. And let's cut it up in a totally different way. Let's cut it up with a sequence of planes like so that just rotate. Now, what's the advantage of this? The advantage of this is that going from one time to another, we're going to think of this angle here as time, going from one time to another is a symmetry operation. Before we do, let's just point out that these geometries are not static. They do not have a time translation invariance. They're not good geometries for discussing um, Hamiltonian physics with a constant Hamiltonian. You would need, at best, a time-dependent Hamiltonian, and it's probably much worse than that for various reasons. But this slicing of the sphere, going from one slice to the next, is a symmetry operation. So when you write the metric, you will discover that the coefficients of the metric have no time dependence. Now let's just be a little careful about what this, uh, in two dimensions, in two dimensions, I think I better draw. Can you uh, picture a three-dimensional sphere cut by, can you? Can you picture a four-dimensional sphere cut by planes this way? Not so easy. A little bit hard to picture, okay? But when you do, this point over here on the sphere where all these sections intersect is not a point. Just to show you what it is, if I were dividing up flat space this way, just ordinary flat four-dimensional space or whatever, let's do three-dimensional space, we would be breaking it up in the following way. Let's see if I can draw this. Uh, Is this picture clear? It's about as clear as I'm ever going to get it, so you better say yes. It's a sequence of planes, a sequence of planes which rotate about an axis in three dimensions. In two dimensions, it would be a sequence of lines rotating about a point. A three-dimensional space, it would be a sequence of planes rotating about a line, what would it be in four dimensions? In four dimensions, it would be a sequence of hyperplanes, three-dimensional hyperplanes, rotating about a two-dimensional axis or about a two-dimensional surface. So this point here really corresponds not to a point, 
but to a two-dimensional surface. To a two-dimensional surface, one more than, than I can picture here, where I can picture a line. All right, this type of slicing is called the static slicing of the sitter space. And I'll write down what the metric is. And the thing to do, of course, is to study this metric and get familiar with it. Study the geometry and study the particular set of coordinates. They are very important coordinates. What they look like in the sitter space is something like this. They do not cover the whole space again. Right, there's our desitter space. Here's the analog of that point. And now we draw light cones. Light cones. These are, these are not light cones. These are light-like planes. And then we foliate with a sequence of light-like planes. And these light-like planes are generated by Lorentz transformation. One from the other by Lorentz transformation. Here, they're generated by rotation. The portion of the de Sitter space covered by the static slicing, this is called the static slicing, is definitely not the full de Sitter space. It's the region in here. Now, of course, you can extend it to the other side also, but we're going to focus on this region in the pink region here. And I'm going to write down, again, what the metric is. The metric in this kind of slicing Again, this is your second problem. Prove that the metric of the static patch of the sitter space, sliced in this way, is given by r squared ds squared equals r squared, there's always that r squared out there, times minus 1 minus r squared, where r is a coordinate which basically measures spatial distance from a point over here. 1 minus r squared, it's part of your job to figure out what r is, d tau squared, same tau, measures proper time along this trajectory, d tau squared, 1 minus r squared, plus dr squared over 1 minus r squared, plus r squared d omega 2 squared. Omega 2 squared, d omega 2 squared, stands for the metric of a unit two-sphere. Now, this is a metric in which the sitter space is presented in a way which is time independent. There are no times in the coefficient functions here, in the metric functions. G naught naught, G one one, G omega omega are all time independent. So this is a static description of the sitter space. It has a radial coordinate which can be thought of, go, to the, go, go right to the center here. The center here is a three-sphere, ordinary three-sphere of space. The center here is a three-sphere. On that three-sphere, we pick a pole. That pole can be thought of as the position of an observer. R is the distance from the observer, and the observer could be thought of as moving along a trajectory like that. So R measures this, or as a coordinate, which measures distance from the observer. Here's the metric. And it will not have escaped you that this metric has a look which looks sort of like a black hole metric. It has a coefficient here, an inverse coefficient here, and it has a horizon. The horizon is the place where G naught naught vanishes, and with the place where G11 diverges. So r equals 1, little r equals 1, Little r equals 1 is the place uh, where the horizon of the sitter space is. And um, if I were to try to draw, let's try to draw a spatial section through here. Here's a spatial section. What is it? It's a three-sphere. Unfortunately, I can't draw a three-sphere, but I can draw a two-sphere. So there's space at an instant of time. This point over here is one of the poles of the sphere, the west pole. The other one over here is the east pole. And that point over here is the equator of the sphere. I could have made it the north pole and the south pole, but then I would have had to turn it on its side, and I would have lost the correspondence with directions here. So these are the two poles of the sphere. 
we're going to be interested, these, this metric here incidentally diverges at r equals one. Where is r equal, well, first of all, where is r equals zero? r equals zero is over here and over here. That's where the, uh, the circle shrinks to zero. r equals one, little r equals one, is on the equator. Okay. There's nothing singular happening on the equator. This is uh, the singularity that's associated with the coordinates. Nothing singular happening on the equator. One observer here, we can imagine another observer over here, but we're gonna study the left-hand side of it. And that's the geometry at any given time, the spatial geometry, all right? In other words, it's this geometry over here, the spatial part of the geometry, space. How many problems have I given you already? Two? Okay, problem number three. Prove that this is a hemisphere. This should be a hemisphere, that's where I got it from. Prove it, prove that this is a hemisphere. A, three, uh, a hemisphere means a three-dimensional hemisphere now. Prove that that's a three-dimensional hemisphere. And as I said, this line here plays the role of horizon. We're gonna study this in a little more detail in a few minutes. R equals one is a horizon, but it's very, very convenient and helpful to redraw these pictures as Penrose diagrams. Now, I do not have either the time or the inclination to go through in detail what Penrose diagrams are. If you don't know, find out fast, because we're gonna be drawing a lot of Penrose diagrams in this class. Uh, they're easy, but I'll tell you quickly what they are. They're useful for rotationally invariant geometries. When there's an, when there's an axis of rotation or a point of rotation, they're useful. They represent only the radial and time-like coordinate, so that at each point of the Penrose diagram, you should think of a sphere of directions, a two-sphere of directions, that's sort of implicitly there. But it's a two-dimensional figure which shows the radial and time-like directions, number one. Number two, it has taken the geometry and mapped it by appropriate coordinate transformation so that all of it, I see my students falling asleep. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Good, get a nap, you'll, get a nap, you'll need it. <laughs> okay. Uh, you take the whole geometry and you map it in such a way as to squeeze it all down onto the finite blackboard by some appropriate mapping. That means a mapping which will map infinity to finite places. But one special rule, when you do so, radial light waves should always move at 45 degrees. You map it in such a way that you preserve the fact that light rays move at 45 direct, uh, degrees. The, this is the Penrose diagram of flat space. What does it correspond to? Here's the center of coordinates, r equals zero. Here's t equals infinity up here. You've taken all of t equals infinity and pushed it here. Here's t equals minus infinity. Here's r equals infinity. And here are the space-like surfaces, all of which move out toward r equals infinity. These are lines of constant radius like that. That's the Penrose diagram of flat space time, okay? What I want is the Penrose diagram for the sitter space. So let me draw the Penrose diagram for the sitter space. It's extremely simple. It's a square. Okay, so let's see what's on the square. There's the west pole and the east pole. Those are the positions of two observers. They correspond to these lines over here. They're over here r equals zero and r equals zero. Going up to the future infinity of the hyperbola, that's up here, t equals infinity, t equals minus infinity. Okay, how about this point over here, the thing that I call the horizon? The horizon's right at the center, 
And the light cones that spread away from it there, the light-like surfaces that spread away from it, just divide the square like so. Whoops. Like so. The global coordinates foliate it in the obvious way as horizontal slices. The um, flat slicing, I'll draw the flat slicing for you. It actually looks like this. But more interesting for right now is the static slicing. So let's draw the static slicing. The static slicing looks like this. And incidentally, these space-like surfaces bunch up near the horizons over here. They bunch up because there's got to be an infinite amount of time along this axis. All right, so this is the static slicing, and uh, those are the various presentations of the sitter space that we'll be working with. The static slicing, here it is, has a horizon, and because it has a horizon, the description within a static slice is thermal. There are another, there's a way to see that they're thermal, a mathematical way to see that, uh, that the properties of this chunk over here are described by thermal equilibrium. That's something for you to explore. You can explore it in various uh, places. I will simply tell you the rules. The rules are that an observer in this static patch here, this is called a static patch, and notice, we, we should make clear that for an observer moving along here, this really is an event horizon. That observer cannot get signals from behind this line here. It really is an a, a event horizon. And it has many of the properties of the event horizon of a black hole. All right, but what we're, going, what we're going to take from the black hole is the fact that the description of an observer in here who's restricted to live on that line, watching things from outside, uh, sees a thermal world. He sees a thermal world with temperature. Let's see what the temperature is. The temperature is 1 over 2 pi times the square root of g naught naught. Let me be clear now. Temperature in general relativity, there are two kinds of temperature. There's coordinate temperature, which is typically taken to be dimensionless, and then there's proper temperature. It's temperature that would be read by an honest thermometer, all thermometers made in the same standard uh, thermometer factory, and you move them around from place to place. If you take such a standard thermometer and you take it upward in the gravitational field, it will show a lower temperature than downward, and that's a redshift phenomenon. All right, so as you move around in here, in particular, as you move in R, the temperature changes, the proper temperature changes, the proper temperature changes, and what is G naught naught? G naught naught is 1 minus R squared, so this is... Uh, square root of 1 minus r squared, but there's some dimensional factor. g naught naught had an r in it, so there's an r downstairs. And that has the proper units of temperature, 1 over length. Incidentally, I am setting the speed of light equal to 1 uh, in everything we're doing. So uh, inverse distance and also h-bar. Inverse distance has units of, uh, of energy, and temperature has units of energy. This is the temperature. Notice that at r equals zero, the temperature, the proper temperature at r equals zero is just one over two pi r. That's usually called the Hawking temperature of the de Sitter space. The bigger the de Sitter space, the smaller the cosmological constant, the bigger the de Sitter space, the cooler is the observer sitting at the center. But the temperature always diverges as you go out to r equals 1. Incidentally, r equals 1 is a hyperboloid, or, or the limit of a hyperboloid, which gets closer and closer to this point over here, and it really means these light cones. So if you get real close to the horizon, it's hot. 
If you're near the center of the de Sitter space, it's, it's as cool as it can be, center meaning r equals zero, it's as cool as it can be anywhere, and it has a temperature. In addition, it has an entropy. The entropy of the de Sitter space, let's see if I wrote it down. Well, it's one quarter the area of the horizon in Planck units. In Planck units, it's one quarter. All right, so if we, if we want to get it out of Planck units, we put a G downstairs. And the area of the horizon is 4 pi, 4 pi r squared. So it's pi r squared over G, which is the same as pi over G h squared. Okay. So this is the Hawking Beckenstein and some other people, uh, entropy of the sitter space, of the static patch of the sitter space. Incidentally, the reason that it has an entropy is because there's entanglement entropy between this side and this side. Whenever you're looking at only a part of a space, there's entanglement entropy with the rest of the, uh, with the, rest of the space, and one way of thinking about this entropy is that it's entanglement entropy. Okay, let's see, How, what time is it now? Let me take a, a quick break for questions, if there are any. Yes. So, I mean, okay, one, one, one thing. I, <laughs> I'm a little bit deaf. Uh, because this is like a situation of a black hole, mm -hmm. is even the entropy of a black hole, is that identical to entanglement entropy, or is that really separate? Well, okay. Um, I, I think the right thing to say is one way of thinking about it is as, as entanglement entropy. There are other ways, and I think it would be a good idea for, for me to spend a little bit of time talking about black holes, so let me defer it for now. Let me defer it for now. But that's an extremely subtle question of whether it is or isn't entanglement entropy, and what it's entanglement with. In one view, it's entanglement with the other side of the horizon. In another view, it's entanglement with the, with the horizon degrees of freedom themselves, the ones which make up the, the entropy. So this is a subtle business that, uh, that um, we, we, I would like to come back to. In fact, I'm sure we'll come back to it. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So you had t and you had a root g00. Yeah. Is there a covariance generalization the I suppose there probably is, but um, Remember, temperature is defined in a frame where the gas or whatever it is is instantaneously at rest. So the, the whole notion of temperature means that you're, uh, that, uh, but yeah, I, I, think there is a, I think there is a covariant definition of it, but um, in this case, well, probably in all cases. Uh, what is it? I'm not sure what it is. I never thought about it very much. But um, in a frame of reference where things are static, that's where temperature is defined. So uh, it's a good question, but yeah, go ahead. Can we think of this as the temperature of something, or is this just Well, it is the temperature that a thermometer would record. But now let's think about, it is the temperature that a thermometer located at that position would record. The only problem is that in a typical situation, Let's say our universe. Our universe has a Hubble constant, which is, um, or an R, an inverse Hubble constant, which is what, 20 billion light years? Something of that order of magnitude. 20 billion light years. It's an extremely big distance. H is an extremely small number. The temperature is impossibly low. Uh, but not impossibly low, it's extremely low. So what kind of thermometer can register temperatures which are, well, I'll tell you what units I know, and I know in Planck units, it's 10 to the minus 60th in Planck units. Does that help you? Now convert that to, uh, it's 10 to the minus a large number in any units you know, so it would take a rather spectacular uh, thermometer to be able to measure it, but it is what a, a thermometer would measure at the center here. If you had a thermometer, now keep in mind, if you, a, a trajectory along here is accelerated. This trajectory is not accelerated. A trajectory which moves on a curved path like this is accelerated, and to keep it accelerated, you would have to provide some force. Here's what you could do. You have a fishing line, okay? 
The universe, because of its de Sitter character, is accelerating outward. That means there's a kind of gravitational anti-gravity pulling everything away from the Earth. And that force is, in fact, proportional to distance. That's what the cosmological constant does. All right, now you take your fishing line, and on the end of your fishing line, you, uh, you put a thermometer, and you cast it out there, and you hold on to it. You don't let it pass through the horizon. You don't let it pass through the horizon, but you hold on to it, and you keep it steady at a distance which you've already calculated is almost the distance to the horizon. You also are connected by a, by a cable to that thermometer so that you can read off its temperature. The temperature will be hot, and the temperature will increase as that uh, thermometer gets closer and closer to the horizon. The horizon, in proper distance from you, is about a distance r. Okay. About a distance r. Not, uh, not a proper distance r. It's, it's about a proper distance r. Not, not exactly. And so, yeah, the temperature would depend on how far you cast out the, uh, the line. Okay, any more? Yeah. R. That's why I say you can, the, the temperature is so low, basically you have one photon in a distance of order 10 billion light years of wavelength 10 billion year, uh, light years. So it's uh, not something... Um, however, keep in mind that we are going to be interested in de Sitter spaces with much larger Hubble constants. In our past was inflation. Perhaps before inflation, there was even a bigger Hubble constant. It is going to be important to take into account that, uh, that the Sitter spaces with large Hubble constant have temperatures. So in our world, it's of no interest whatever uh, from the point of view of measuring things. In a world with a very, very much larger Hubble constant, maybe a thousand or, uh, well, maybe... Uh, 10 to the 7th times smaller than the, uh, than the Planck uh, mass, that temperature is important. It creates fluctuations, and those fluctuations are important. Okay. If there are no more questions, I'm going to go on to another set of coordinates. Now, I, I know coordinates are pretty dull things, but it's necessary to master them. It is really necessary to master them. Another set of coordinates which I'm going to write, I'm going to use them in the flat space slicing. They're called conformal coordinates. And they're very, very good coordinates for exploring the causal structure. What's in causal contact with what? Who can send messages to whom? All right, so let's start again with the flat slicing of the sitter space. Here it is. I've got it right here. Uh, let me write it again. ds squared is equal to minus d tau squared plus e to the 2 tau, dxi, dxi. All right. This much is flat space over here. Right. Wouldn't it be nice if we had an e to the 2 tau over here so that we could take the e to the 2 tau on the outside? Well, we don't have an e to the 2 tau over here. But we can define a new coordinate dt such that dt is equal to d tau divided by e to the tau. Do I have that right? In other words, that dt times e to the tau is equal to d tau. If I do that, then I can, place, I can replace this with dt squared and pull an e to the tau on the outside. Now, this is an easy equation to integrate. And what do we get? We get t is equal to minus e to the minus tau. That's a little bit funny. T, t is negative, but that's OK. T is negative. And it runs from minus infinity to 0. When tau is deep in the negative past, this is large and negative. And then when tau goes to the remote future, 
t goes to infinity. With this, oh, incidentally, there is an r squared here. I forgot the r squared. There should always be an r squared on the outside. And with this definition, we have that ds squared is equal to r squared times minus dt squared plus dx squared divided by t squared. Now where did I get the t squared from? t squared or t squared is equal to e to the minus 2 tau, but it's e to the plus 2 tau, which appears in the metric, so there's a t squared downstairs here. Okay. This is the metric in conformal coordinates. We can write it this way. I usually write it this way most of the time, h squared downstairs. Very simple. Flat space-time, but with an overall factor of 1 over h squared t squared. t runs, as I said, from minus infinity to infinity. So this geometry only has, it only has a past. Of course, it doesn't only have a past. It has a future, too. But the remote future, little t or little tau equals infinity or little t equals infinity, is all on this horizontal slice here. So here's t equals infinity. And slicing things up into tau, sorry, slicing things up into t, is dividing up the time interval of the sitter space in a kind of logarithmic way. Each one of these intervals is the same in proper time, and it corresponds to an interval of order of magnitude t equals 1 over h. During each one of these intervals, the size of the universe doubles, or the size of the scale factor doubles. During each one of these in intervals, here's the scale factor, 1 over ht. During each interval, the size of the scale factor doubles. The same amount of proper time elapses. And that's not surprising because the, uh, because the uh, scale factor is exponential. OK, so this is the sitter space in conformal coordinates. And the special value of it is light rays. Look at what a light ray is. A light ray is just dt equals dx. In other words, the motion of light rays doesn't give a damn about this factor in the denominator here. The motion of light rays is exactly the same as it would be in ordinary flat space-time. In other words, light rays just move along 45 degrees. Okay. Whoops, that one's not very 45. In every direction, light rays move along 45 degrees. And from this point of view, it's very easy to tell who can send a message to whom. This person over here can send messages to everywheres in here. This person up here can receive messages from anybody in the backward light cone. All right? The only thing odd about it from this point of view is it comes to an end. So it's as if you had flat space time that just came to an end, but not quite. You do have to keep track of this factor here. It's what gives the space time curvature. OK. Um, another bit of terminology. Another bit of terminology. This terminology is more general than just the sitter space. It's an important concept, so I'll introduce it. Typically, space times have future boundaries. I'll give you some examples of some future boundaries. In the sitter space time, the future boundary would simply be t equal, capital T equals 0. More generally, the future boundary could be more complicated. It could be wavy, or it could be light-like. An example of a light-like future boundary would be flat space-time. Flat space-time has a Penrose diagram which looks like this. Here's the future boundary. This light cone, this asymptotic light cone, together with t equals infinity, define the future boundary of flat space-time. All kinds of space-times, they typically have future boundaries. And 
I now want to define what's called a causal patch. A causal patch is a very important concept, uh, maybe, more, maybe more important than a lot of people recognize who work in these things. Pick a point on the future boundary. If it's the sitter space, then it's just a horizontal line. If it's flat space-time, it either corresponds to t equals infinity up here or a point on the future light cone. Okay. And simply draw the backward light cone of it. The backward light cone is called the causal past. Let's call this point A. It's called the causal past of A. Or this region here in the interior of it, the interior is called the causal past, or just the causal patch associated with A. Every point in the future boundary has its own causal patch. Sometimes they overlap. Other, in some regions they overlap, in some regions they don't overlap. And if you think about it, any observer who lives on a time-like trajectory which ultimately arrives at A can see things only within his causal patch. All of his physics, all the things that he can detect, is within the causal patch. That's the meaning of the causal patch. Everything that a particular observer can see. Now, of course, different observers will have the same causal patch if they go to the same point. They'll have different causal patches if they go to different points. How about over here? In flat space time, the causal patch associated with t equals infinity up here is everything. The backward light cone and everything inside it is simply everything. So flat space time, uh, from the point of view of a very distant future observer, distant in, in time, uh, that observer can look back and see everything. In, you could also ask, what about the causal patch of somebody who lives over here? Causal patch of somebody, who, not somebody who lives over here, but an observer who goes to that point. Now, that observer has to accelerate. And in order to get out to that point, it has to have constant acceleration, constant eternal acceleration, basically, to get out to that point. But uh, there is also a causal path to this. If I fill in this diagram over here, this is for the uh, specialists now. If I fill in this diagram here, this becomes a what's called a causal diamond. And that causal diamond is Rindler space. It's the space time as seen by an acceler uniformly accelerated observer. But never mind. It's not important if you don't know what I, what I mean. Uh, so causal paths are associated with points in space time. Another example would be in a black hole. There's a black hole geometry. The causal past of anybody outside the black hole at t equals infinity is everything outside the horizon of the black hole. But there are people who fall, um, have the misfortune of falling into the black hole, and their causal path looks like this. OK, so that's the idea of a causal patch. One other thing about causal patches, in particular the causal patch of the sitter space, Here's the sitter space, everything below that line. Here's the causal patch of a point. Now, I'm going, the causal patch is a region of space time. But if I foliate the space time by space like sections like that, then I can speak of a causal patch at an instant of time. This region over here, which is of course a sphere, I will call the causal past at an instant of time, that's too big a phrase. So let's just call it the instantaneous causal, uh, causal patch of point A. Now here's an interesting thing about the sitter space, and an important thing, a really important thing. There's a sense in which as time goes forward, the number of causal patches, the causal patches replicate and the causal patches, the number of them grow exponentially with time. So let me show you how you think about that. Take, again, the sitter space, and take a slice of it at a particular time. Draw a bunch of causal patches. 
Uh, I can't quite fit them together to fill up the space in a non-overlapping way except in one dimension, but take this volume, and that volume defines by definition the volume associated with a causal patch at a given time. All right, so at a given time, tau, or t, we could say that a given region of space occupies a certain number of causal patches. Incidentally, the size of a causal patch is about r. But uh, the definition of causal patch doesn't depend on the definition of r. You just draw these light cones backward, and you can define in that way volumes associated with causal patches. And roughly speaking, I can say a given coordinate volume, here's a given coordinate volume, not a given proper volume, but a given coordinate volume, is x number of causal patch sizes big. Now what happens as time goes on? The causal patches replicate. Time goes on a little more. We can say the causal patches reproduce, and each one produces a certain number of new causal patches. Depends on the dimensionality, how many new ones it produces. Uh, roughly speaking, in three dimensions, every causal patch, when you double, uh, when you when you go one step, when you go one step, what does it mean? That means a time t of order inverse h, one step in, uh, in capital T. In three dimensions, the number of causal patches in a given coordinate area gets multiplied by eight. Why eight? Because it's two to the third, okay? In two dimensions, the number of causal patches would get multiplied by four. In three dimensions, the number of causal patches, sorry, in one dimension, the number of causal patches would double, and so forth. This replication of causal patches is, in some sense, the, the most important thing about eternal inflation. The construction that I did here did not really depend very much on the exact definition of the sitter space. It just said, take a slice, continue to slice it in different ways, and the number of causal patches will grow. And typically, it will grow exponentially. Okay. The causal patch, the, the, the meaning of the causal patch should be, you should think of it as defining a lattice spacing, as defining a cell size on a surface. In various mathematical theories of the sitter space, which relate the De Sitter space to quantum field theories on space-like sections here, each causal patch plays the role of a point in the lower dimensional space. It plays the, the role of a point. Of course, there's lots of degrees of freedom in here. Many, many people can exist inside a causal patch, but all of those people are counted as degrees of freedom associated with one cell that theme, that theme of causal patches in the sitter space being like cells of a quantum field theory, that has become somewhat pervasive by now among uh, some class of theorists and eternally in other inflating kinds of theorists uh, have become used to that idea. So that suggests that we think of these inflating spaces as lattice systems where the number of lattice points replicates, each e-folding or each, yeah, each e-folding or perhaps two-folding, each two-folding of the geometry where length scales get doubled or whatever, each e-folding replicates the number of causal patches and therefore replicates the number of lattice sites on some kind of construction uh, which we're going to study in some detail. In fact, I think we're going to come to it right now. How much time do we have? 20 minutes? Okay. All right, I'm interested in the following problem. It's a problem that has been studied uh, very beautifully by Matthias and 
his collaborators, uh, Senatori, who else? Uh, there are too many of them, Criminelli, uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. Matthias, help. The problem, the problem of phase transitions uh, from one kind of behavior to another. Um, we now come to the problem of eternal inflation. Eternal, not internal. Eternal inflation. Internal inflation also happens, but when it does, you come to Princeton, and that fixes you up real good. Okay, now we have to come to the issue of bubble nucleation. Bubble nucleation occurs because this landscape, let's, we're gonna take a very simple model to begin with. The very simple model is a potential, a simple landscape which has two minima. One of them happens to be right at zero cosmological constant. Our own vacuum is very close to zero cosmological constant, not quite and another inflating vacuum, which is up here. This is not the kind of figure that you would draw to describe slow, conventional slow roll inflation. It's the kind you would use to study eternal inflation, and to get from here to here, you have to tunnel. Tunneling, incidentally, is not something that happens simultaneously everywhere. We will come to what a tunneling uh, transition looks like, but this is the picture, tunneling from here to here. And we're going to explore the question of, in the space of parameters, in particular, the height of the potential here, in the space of parameters, when does eternal inflation occur, when doesn't eternal inflation occur, and how many different phases, how many different types of eternal inflation are there? It turns out eternal inflation is not one phenomenon. It's many phenomena many different kinds of eternal inflation. Uh, very quickly, if you have a potential like this, then basically there's no inflation at all. You just roll down and you go down to the bottom. The FRW universe just grows and, uh, and does whatever it does and eventually just comes to rest or whatever. Uh, if you have a potential like that, then you get trapped in here. And essentially, you get trapped forever in there, although here and there, locally in space, there may be tunneling phenomena. As you lower this potential, there are phase transitions. There's a sequence of phase transitions and a sequence of different behaviors. And it's interesting to, uh, to try to classify those behaviors, just to know what kind of thing we're talking about. What kind of different phenomena are we grouping together under the rubric of, uh, of eternal inflation. All right, first thing to know is that when a tunneling event happens, here we are, we're sitting up here in the vacuum, a metastable vacuum up here, Let's give it a name. Let's call this the ancestor vacuum, and let's call this one here uh, the descendant vacuum. You go from here to here. That's giving birth to a, uh, to a younger generation of vacuums, starting up here. So we start with the ancestor vacuum here. And what does not happen? We have this infinite slicing of the sitter space. Let's think in terms of the infinite slicing of the sitter space. It's extremely unlikely that the whole thing is simultaneously going to go plop from one vacuum to the other. That's not the way phase transitions happen in quantum field theory. It's not the way phase transitions happen in condensed matter physics. What happens is bubbles nucleate someplace. A bubble nucleates. Let's say that that bubble nucleates at time minus capital T, in conformal coordinates. Then the bubble starts to grow. If it's big enough, if it's big enough, it will start to take over, and it will start to grow. We're going to study bubble nucleation a little bit, but basically it grows very quickly. It's uh, the domain wall that separates it from the original vacuum, spreads out quickly, 
and very quickly reaches the speed of light or gets asymptotically close to the speed of light. Uh, a simple enough approximation, and one which is very close to the truth, is it just a domain wall spreads out with the speed of light. Inside the domain wall, we have the descendant vacuum. Outside the domain wall, we have the ancestor vacuum. Now, the phenomena of bubble nucleation is very similar to bubble nucleation in condensed matter physics. You have some, how many people have read Cat's Cradle? Okay, what happens in Cat's Cradle? Cat's Cradle is a metastable phase of a water called ice nine. No, no, it's the water which is met metastable. And it can decay to ice nine. It's, the tunneling rate is very small, so it doesn't readily happen, but some bad guy kicks off a transition and makes uh, ice nine, a little bit of ice nine, and then the ice nine bubble expands. Well, no big tragedy, it only expands a certain amount until it's finished, but uh, Cat's Cradle was not written in the sitter space, it was written in ordinary flat space time. What will inevitably happen in flat space time, here's flat space time, is a bubble will nucleate, but other bubbles will nucleate. There will be, on the average, a mean separation between the bubbles. But an infinite number of bubbles will nucleate, and they will come crashing together. And eventually, the whole sample will make a transition to the, uh, to the lower energy state. That's what happened to the world in Cat's Cradle. All the water turned into ice nine. All the bubbles come crashing together. But the new phenomenon in, uh, in eternal inflation is at the same time that these bubbles are being nucleated, the ancestor vacuum is inflating. Inflating means exponentially growing. So that means the distance between these, well, the distance between points here is getting larger and larger. And that allows the possibility that the bubbles, the separation of the bubbles due to the inflation, allows them to outrun the, uh, the tendency for them to grow together. Now you can see this right on this diagram here. It's immediately evident here that here's a situation where infinitely many bubbles nucleate. But because of this termination at late time, they simply won't come crashing together. You could have a uniform distribution of bubbles nucleate at some given instant of time. In flat space, they would come crashing together and cause the whole space to make a transition. In the sitter space, no such thing. This is the phenomenon of inflation of the background allowing the bubbles, uh, allowing the inflation to beat out the, uh, the tendency of the bubbles to grow. So you see it right on this diagram here. Here's what we want to investigate. We want to investigate under what circumstances will, of course, if the bubble nucleation is too frequent, if the barrier here is too low, so that the bubble nucleation rate is too large, then you can get into a situation where the bubbles nucleate too frequently and too, uh, to a too small a distance between them, and the whole thing does go kaplooey into the, into the ice nine phase or into the, into the uh, lower phase there. In that case, you would say that um, inflation was aborted or, uh, or exterminated or whatever by bubble nucleation, which eventually put everything down here. On the other hand, if the bubble nucleation is low enough, then the mean separation between these bubble nucleations are such that they can outrun uh, their, ten their own tendency to expand. So we would like some sort of qualitative, semi-quantitative way to investigate whether, uh, whether you eternally inflate, which means these regions in between never quite get filled up. They always continue to inflate. The bubbles never completely take over the whole thing. Or whether, uh, or whether the eternal inflation is killed.
Let me give you a way to think about it, a simple way to think about it. Okay. Let's take into account, let's begin, here's, here I think is the best way to think about this, this, these kind of questions. Let's take all bubbles which nucleate within a time, go back a step. Let's begin the world all up in here. All right. Now we take one e-folding of inflation, one e-folding or one two-folding. One two-folding means a time t of order one over h. It is a step of capital T, one step of capital T. And let's take all of the all of the bubbles which nucleate in that step during that time, and just for simplicity, let's imagine them nucleating all at the same time at a conformal time minus t. In the next round, we will add in all those bubbles which nucleate in the next two folding, and then in the next two folding. But let's stop. Let's not do that yet. Let's just take the bubbles which nucleate within the first two-folding here, let them expand, and then look at the system from the top. Look at it from above. Look at it from the perspective of t equals infinity. And what we will see is a collection of bubbles, all of the same size. They're all of the same size because they nucleated at the same time. When I speak of size, I'm talking about coordinate size. There are coordinates laid down on here, not proper size. All proper sizes go to infinity up here. We'll see a statistical collection of them like this. The inflation will clearly be aborted if the mean separation between these is smaller than the size of them then they're going to be crowded on top of each other, and if there are too many of them, they will completely abort the eternal inflation. So the right question then to try to answer whether eternal inflation takes place or whether at least you escape one round of e-folding here is whether the distance, the coordinate distance, the coordinate distance, the mean coordinate distance between bubbles is larger than or equal or less than the coordinate size of the bubbles. What's the, uh, I think it's getting, um, all right, let, let's see if we can do the calculation. Do we, we have 10 minutes? Yeah. It'll either take, it's, it won't take very long. Okay, now the control parameter is the height of the barrier here. What does it control? It controls the nucleation rate. Let's call the nucleation rate gamma, and the meaning of gamma is it's the probability per unit four volume, per, per unit proper four value, volume. The probability per proper unit, per unit, <laughs> the probability that in a unit four volume a bubble nucleates. It's not a probability per unit time, it's a probability per unit time per unit space. So it's probability per unit proper volume for volume. So it has units of one over length to the fourth. We can write it in terms of a pure number gamma times h to the fourth. h has units of inverse length. If we measure everything in Hubble units, then gamma is the, uh, is the probability per unit for Hubble volume that a nucleation takes place. So let's define the dimensionless variable small gamma in this way. It's small gamma, which is going to be the figure of merit of whether we do or we don't eternally inflate. Okay, good. So now let's see if we can calculate the mean separation as a function of gamma. We do it in steps. Take a coordinate volume, big coordinate volume, delta x, 
The coordinate volume is delta x cubed. Now, when I say coordinate volume, it's dimensionless. It's just a box of size delta x, of coordinate size delta x by delta x by delta x. And let's, let's ask, how many bubbles nucleate within the first e-folding here? I'll use the word e-folding and two-folding uh, synonymously. During, during the first doubling time here, how many bubbles nucleate? Okay, so the first, so you, you first calculate the volume in this region. You first calculate the volume of this region. The volume of this region is delta x times the scale factor cubed. And the scale factor, where is the scale factor? The scale factor is 1 over h capital T. That's the scale factor A. All right, so this looks like it is delta x divided by h t cubed. That's the volume of this region here at time t. Now multiply it by the rate, the number of, the rate is the number of nucleations in a unit four volume. So that's gamma h, which was h to the fourth. And now multiply it by delta t. We still have yet to multiply it by delta t. This was the uh, rate per unit space per unit time, so we have to multiply it by, by delta t, but delta t is simply 1 over h. So that's another 1 over h downstairs. Upstairs, downstairs, downstairs. That's the number of bubbles that are nucleated in here, in one e-folding. Okay, let's cancel out the H's. There's three of them here, four of them, four of them upstairs. Wow, boy, H cancels out altogether. Now let's consider the density of bubbles. This is the number in a four volume delta X, in a three volume delta X cubed. The density of them, the density of, the, of nucleations means the density per coordinate volume, per coordinate volume. The density of them is just 1 over, well, multiply by delta x cubed. This is just the inverse density here. As being the inverse density, it's also the cube of the mean spatial separation between uh, the inverse of the density is the mean separation between things. No, it's the cube of the mean separation. So this is the cube of the mean separation between bubbles. 1 over t cubed. Do I have this right? Times gamma. No, no, gamma. No, I have it upside down. Yeah. This is the density. It multiplied delta x cubed. We have to turn it over to find the, uh, the mean distance. So the mean distance cubed is t cubed divided by gamma. Notice when gamma gets small, the mean distance gets large. Now, what is the size of one of these bubbles? The size of one of these bubbles, when it's projected onto future infinity, is just t. So the size of the bubble is t. The volume of the bubble is t cubed, and it's being compared with t cubed over gamma. Do I have that right? I think I have it right. Yeah. OK. T cubed, don't, T is not the temperature, incidentally. Whenever I see T, it always hits me temperature. It's not. It's the conformal time here. That's the size of a bubble. So we're comparing this with T cubed itself. We could take the cube root of it to define the length between them. We're comparing t divided by gamma to the one-third with t. It's clear that when gamma is significantly less than one, the distance between, we could have guessed this, of course we could have guessed this, but when gamma is significantly less than one, 
the distance between these bubbles when projected onto future infinity is larger than their size, significantly larger than their size when gamma is much less than one. So when gamma is much less than one, and that's the only parameter that enters here is gamma, you escape the first round of e-foldings here, and you are left with some inflating volume. Well, you can now take all the region which has not been killed by bubble nucleation. Killed means stopped from inflating, drop down to here. You can take it out and ask again. Let's take this region over here. Do exactly the same thing for the next e-folding here. And what you will find is, again, exactly the same thing. If gamma is significantly less than one, the next e-folding will not kill you. For the same reason, the bubbles will now be more frequent, because there's more volume in here, because of the exponential increase, but they'll also be geometrically smaller when projected onto infinity. Because they're geometrically smaller, everything scales, and you find exactly the same formula. You escape the next round of, uh, or eternal inflation ex escapes for the next round if gamma is significantly less than one, and so forth and so on. So if gamma is significantly less than one, bubbles do not take over the entire geometry. There's always regions in between which are eternally inflating. Uh, there are transitions, and the transitions are as a function of gamma. I guess it's too late to go into those transitions today. We'll go into them tomorrow a little bit, and I'll describe the various, um, the various phases that exist and the various types of behaviors, statistical behaviors, which, um, which, is, which simple models seem to indicate exist. Okay, till tomorrow. <laughs>